It was a very, very dark evening in the rainforest about 9 o'clock, and the village was sound asleep when they heard these crying sounds emanating from the direction of the river. The dogs that had been asleep there on the dirt floor in the little carved out area stood to their feet and barked, and the babies cried in their little hammocks that were strung between two poles. And mom and dad leaped from their cane pole bed that was lashed on the side wall. He reached for his rusty old shotgun and made his way to the doorway and peeked out into the inky blackness, wondering what could it be. And his wife came behind him and fanned the flames of that dying little fire that was three logs butted together. It sprung to life and she lit her little kerosene wick lantern. It gave off yellow smoke and she too made her way to the doorway and looked out into the night and they wondered where these cries were coming from and, and Indians were coming from many, many different directions with the same thought in mind. And they listened again and they could hear these terrifying cries. And they followed the sounds to the edge of the river over that steep bank and looked out into that empty blackness and could see nothing. But then again they heard the cries for help. It seems as though three men had crossed the river that day. <clears throat> they had gone to the other side to participate in a, a beer fest. Now, a beer fest in that part of the world is a little different than it would be around our parts. The ladies prepare their beer themselves. Uh, their staple diet food is yucca. It's a root plant. You pull it out of the ground, long tuberous things. You cook them put salt on them and eat that. And it's a whole lot there with the potluck. <laughs> and I enjoyed that meal so much tonight. Oh, that Man. was wonderful. That was delicious. We have potluck there once in a while, too. Uh, you realize where the name potluck came from? <clears throat> it came from our area. Because you'll be lucky if certain things are not in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> For one night, the students went by our home. It was dark. <coughs> and they called to me, and I stood on our little porch looking out across the, the lawn in a lovely moonlit night. I could see them there, uh, their, their silhouettes and the, the, the shadows. And they said, we've been successful. We, we, ate, we, we got meat for tomorrow's meal. No, we want you to be with us in the dining hall. And we thought, oh, that'll be wonderful. One, did they catch maybe a tapir? That's the largest animal in the jungle. It's a very large animal. We call it cow-like. Or could it be deer? Our deer meat is absolutely luscious. Uh, the fruits and berries they eat are, are, are not strong in flavor, and so the meat is absolutely wonderful. Or could it be wild pig? It might be wild pig, which we were very fond of, too. Or it might be ronsoco. I don't know if you've ever eaten ronsoco, capybara. It's the world's largest uh, flat-nosed rodent, big rat, uh, 60 pounds. Uh, the meat's not bad. I saw them as they went by, and, and dripping out of their basket was these bloody droplets uh, to the ground. I could see the meat had been wrapped in banana leaves. As they made their way and said, we'll see you tomorrow, and I said, okay, and they disappeared. The next morning, we taught our classes up on the 325-stepped hill to the Bible College, and at noon, we entered into our little dining hall. It was dirt floor as well. The tables were very crude. The benches, no backs on them. Our cook, barefooted as he would, big bro, toes and feet, never seen a pair of shoes and never would. He stood there with uh, three pots on the floor. Students lined up with their bowls and their hands and their spoon. And they put us to the front of the line. Special guest today. And he removed the lid from one pot, and it was the boiled yucca, which is staple. And another pot, and it was the boiled green banana, cooking banana. And another pot, and there was some rice. And then the last pot, the huge pot, he took the lid off, and you could see this brothy, bubbly material dancing around in the pot. And he took a great big ladle, a spoon, and he began to stir around that huge pot, and stirring it, and things began to float to the top. And I saw merging out of that brothy material, this huge black monkey's head. 
and it was bobbing up and down in there, and it flipped over, and I saw the tongue hanging out of the mouth, the ears still on it, the eyes looking at me, the hair had not been completely singed. I thought my wife would pass out. <laughs> and he shoved that hen to one side, and I was glad I knew enough about their culture at that time, for he who hunts is the only one who gets the head. Thank the Lord. <laughs> I knew I hadn't been hunting. <laughs> and later I saw him, he had that thing, he held it in his hand just like you would a submarine sandwich, and began to munch on that soft part of the cheeks, eating out all that soft flesh around the cheeks, that's a favorite part. And they clean out all the cheeks, so forth, and uh, it, it's a sight. He reached down in there and picked up a lower arm, still had the hand on it, and the fingers and the knuckles, a little bit of hair on the knuckles, he flipped that into my bowl. And I thought, Lord, why did they have to invite us today? <laughs> well, we ate monkey many times since. And they heard these cries from the river. These three men had crossed there to drink. Now, the way you make their native beer is, this is just a small pot, but they make <clears throat> clay pots about five gallon in size, and they sit on a little tripod, a bamboo tripod inside their homes, has a big banana leaf over the mouth of the pot with a vine around it to keep the leaf in place and the flies out. Uh, the ladies make the, the beer there. They take the yucca, which is their stable, they boil it, and she stuffs it into her mouth, fills her mouth with it, and mixes it, and chews it, and rolls around their saliva, and tries to talk to you at the same time as a sight. And then she spits it in this huge broad mouth pot. She chews off some more. Aren't you glad we had the pot like first? <laughs> she chews off some more of this, stuffs it in her mouth, licks off every finger, chews that, rolls it around, mixing well with her saliva, which has the enzymes in it. And she does this for hours until she has about a three-quarter pot full. Sometimes another lady or help, or maybe her daughter, they chew and chew and chew. And then they have a little water to stretch it, and it needs that. And then she takes a clean banana leaf and puts it over the top of it, wraps a vine around it, and leave that sit to ferment for three days. Now, a big Masato bust is when the men use it on a weird detail. The Indians have gone out maybe to drag a, to drag a canoe from the high country dug out canoe that they've made. They have, to, they have to make a trail, which takes a lot of men in the village, so he invites them, and they all know at the end of the three-day period the beer will be ready. Or maybe they just made a new garden area, or they just built a new bamboo fastenable roof, and that requires a lot of manpower, so their payment is a three-day or two-day bust. And they come in off the trail, or whatever they've been doing, and it's ready now, and uh, the men come in and they've just uh, been in the river down there and washed the dirt off of them and they've come up to the house, they've got their hunting trunks on and that's all. No shirt, they're barefooted. They tell their wife they want some homemade beer. She goes to the big pot, takes the leaf off, and now that fermented, pre-digested, now strong alcoholic drink, she dips a gourd down in there and has little holes in it. And then she siphons that frothy material into this bowl, the bigger chunk stand here. And her man, she serves her man, and he takes that and he turns his back. You never drink while someone's watching him. And he drinks it, ha, ha, pipe, pipe. And she gives him another, about two or three later, while he's ready for the party, <laughs> he gets a little excited. He puts on his ankle bracelets around his uh, ankle, takes the chote seed out of that little pod, and paints his face up with it, and paints his chest and his arms. And then he'll take his crown of feathers, put those over his head, tie his hair back in a ponytail in the back. He might even put on his beautiful, lovely, effervescent beetle winged earrings. You see, in that culture, traditionally, only men wore earrings, not women. And uh, you can see we have no trouble adjusting back to our culture here in the States. <laughs> And uh, two or three bowlfuls while he's uh, ready to dance, he takes a spear like this one here, which traditionally was used for killing of people. Uh, they were revenge killers, warriors. Many, many years ago, not in my history there, but many years ago, they were the headhunters of the upper Amazon. 
They were the Indians, the Avaruna, with the Wampisa, who decapitated their victim after killing them with a spear, and then they would shrink their head, the scalp, shrink it, and then tie the eyes together and so forth, and put that on the side of their hut as a war trophy. But they believed that when they killed their enemy, they would receive his spirit power from the spirit world and become even a greater warrior. So he would grab his spear. They still do this today. We grab his spear into the beating of the drum, like you see here. Then the men do a fancy footwork, and it's hey, 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 as they go around in a circle and practice their authoritative, powerful speaking ability. And so these three men had crossed the river that day. They were drunk. And now at 9 o'clock, they elected to come back across the river to their home. As they came back across the river, the river's fast, treacherous. A wave hit that canoe broadside, and they thought they were going to capsize. And as the canoe rocked, their paddles were wrenched from their hands and drifted away in the current. And now these three men lie at the bottom of that canoe with no way to get to shore. And they were crying for men to come and help them. Well, the men and women and children now made their way to the edge of the river. And they heard again as the canoe now was drifting with the current, fast out of sound. And their voices trailed as they said, please come and help us. And the men said, we can't do a thing. It's too dark. We have no light sufficient. We have no motor craft. Because 15 minutes they will be into the rapid and whirlpool area. We would all be lost. The women were crying, for some of them knew that it was their husbands. Children were crying, clinging to their mother's legs. The dogs were barking. And there was chaos in the middle of the group. And then all of a sudden, a man appeared. A man who had on just trunks, bare-chested, barefooted, a paddle over his shoulder, and he strode through that crowd of people without saying a word, dropped out of sight down the bank to the river's edge. There his canoe was tied. He untied that, that strong vine that was held to the cane pole jabbed into the soil. He threw the vine into the canoe and instructed the young man to jump in the front as he strode to the back of the canoe and sat on a little carved out seat. The young man, without realizing what he was doing, jumped in the front of the canoe, and the first thing you knew, the man at the back swung the canoe around, the currents picked it up, and they were out of sight of the people now on the bank. And down the river they went, searching for those three men that they could no longer hear. They could still hear back over their shoulder the women crying on the bank, crying because they knew their men were lost. The people wondered, why would this man do that? Why would he risk his life? <clears throat> because he was the man that the village had despised. He was the man that the village had reviled. He was the man that the men tempted to fight. He was the man that they tried to get to drink the native beer, and he wouldn't any longer. Oh, there was a day when he did. You see, he was probably the biggest drunk in the whole village. He was a warrior. We do not know how many men he killed in a lifetime. He was a rugged individual. He fought with the best of them and always won. His name was revered up and down the river. He was hated and yet respected. But then one day, he knelt at an altar. One of our first converts. You could hear an all a sigh over the church when he came to the altar of prayer. People could not.